If you've watched many of my videos, you probably know that I find CPU upgrade cards for vintage Macs to be an interesting topic. All of the accelerators we've looked at so far have been quite straightforward with easy installation. But it wasn't always this way. This time, let's check out an upgrade for one of Apple's most popular models from the 80s that let the machine pack a serious punch. The Macintosh SE was in several ways a major departure from the models that came before it. It still kept the same overall size and all-in-one form factor with 9-inch black and white CRT, but its appearance was updated to match the rest of Apple's industrial design language. The bigger changes were on the inside, though, in that the SE was the first compact Mac to offer either dual floppy drives or a built-in hard drive, as was the case with this particular machine. SE stood for system expansion, something that the Mac had sorely lacked up to that point. Steve Jobs had famously wanted the Mac to stay a closed platform, without any options for internal expandability or upgrades. But after he was ousted from Apple in 1985, nothing was stopping the company's engineers from reversing that decision. So they quickly got to work. One of two new models introduced in March 1987 was the Macintosh 2, Apple's first modular desktop Mac. In addition to supporting color, it also included expansion card connectors and was targeted squarely at the burgeoning desktop publishing market. But it was overkill for the needs of many Mac users, so the SE was released alongside it as a more mainstream model. And critically, it too managed to pack a single expansion port inside its chassis. In other ways, though, the SE wasn't all that different from its predecessors. It used the same 8 MHz Motorola 68000 processor that had debuted with the original Mac 128K and, at least initially, retained the same 800K floppy drive from the Mac Plus. But the inclusion of an internal SCSI connector was a welcome change, as even with dual floppy drives, constantly swapping disks was getting old by 1987. So the internal hard drive option was a popular choice. The SE garnered good reviews and established a reputation as a solid machine. But the price gap between it and the Mac 2 started at around $2,500 US, and only got wider depending on the configuration. And this put off some power users who wanted better performance, but didn't need all the features the bigger desktop provided. Granted, Mac 2 owners got their money's worth, as that machine was three and a half times faster than the SE. But clearly, there was a small market for a solution in between the two. One that third parties ended up catering to. I stumbled across one of them, a CPU upgrade called the Prodigy SE made by Levco. It was a daughter card that connected to the SE's motherboard through its expansion connector. But since that wasn't really one of Apple's intended uses for it, Levco had its work cut out for it. The large size of the Prodigy was because, in some ways, it was another motherboard in and of itself. The star of the show is this, a Motorola 68020 processor clocked at 16 MHz, the same as in the Mac 2. Just next to it is an optional chip, a floating point unit or FPU, which can offload certain kinds of mathematical calculations from the CPU and perform them much faster. To make both of these work took fairly complicated engineering, but it did afford Levco an additional opportunity. The SE was limited to a maximum of 4 megabytes of RAM, which at the time was a good amount, but still less than what the Mac 2 could handle. The Prodigy offered its own onboard memory in a variety of capacities. Mine has 4 megabytes, but it ranged from 1 all the way up to 32 megs. And if you had the optional memory management chip, which mine lacks, both the motherboard and Prodigy RAM could be used at the same time. 
And speaking of memory, the connector on one end of this module was showing a bit of corrosion, so I got it cleaned up. Hopefully that wouldn't prove to be a problem later. Let's get this one installed. Levco generally recommended that buyers have their dealer take care of this, but it wasn't actually all that involved. After removing the SE's rear housing, I just needed to disconnect the cables going to its motherboard, then slide it out of the chassis. Normally the Prodigy would plug into the PDS connector, but since mine came already attached to a motherboard, I opted to just swap the whole thing. The upgrade did make things a bit tight in terms of clearances, so much that it actually sits at a slight angle in order to clear the RAM modules. There was just enough room to get the upgraded motherboard back in the chassis, then I could reconnect the cables. Normally the Prodigy would make exclusive use of the PDS expansion connector, but Levco came up with a clever adapter that could add one back in and just managed to fit inside the cramped space and around the existing structure. While this particular SE originally came with a 20 megabyte hard drive, it looks like this one's been upgraded. The pink drive tray is an aftermarket part and it holds a 50 megabyte drive from Quantum. A sticker on top lists a date of 1991, and drive upgrades were very common during that era, as capacities were increasing rapidly. Before I completely reassembled the Mac, I wanted to test it out first. I plugged it in and flipped the switch, but there was no startup chime, and worse, I got this checkerboard pattern on screen. In the middle of it was a sad Mac icon, which is never a good thing. I was afraid I had a bunch of board level diagnostics ahead of me, but out of curiosity, I pressed the reset button on the side, and funny enough, that did the trick. This board had likely sat for decades without being used, so maybe it just needed a moment to sort itself out. The cost of the Prodigy SE varied based on the options you chose, but list price for this specific one would have been in the ballpark of $3,100. That would have been only a bit less than the cost of this Mac itself, so the big question is if the performance was as good as Levco advertised. To access all the settings for the upgrade card, I needed to install a control panel, and I noticed something amusing while the machine rebooted. The ROM on the card added the Prodigy banner to the boot screen to show it was working, but in a blink and you'll miss it kind of moment, Levco apparently got a little cheeky and added fangs to the Happy Mac icon. And that's not necessarily hyperbole. This machine boots and runs incredibly fast now. The built-in processor cache is enabled by default, as is the FPU. Not all programs written during this era were capable of utilizing a math coprocessor, but a neat trick this control panel could perform is to redirect appropriate calculations to the FPU, making such software run even faster than its developer intended. One final option here is an interesting one. MacWrite was a very popular word processing program at the time, but it had an inherent incompatibility with the Prodigy. Launching it would cause the system to crash. The MacWrite sniffer option could detect if it had been launched and do some on-the-fly software reconfiguration to get it to work. Time for some benchmarks. In the speedometer suite, the original SE had scored a 1 for both its CPU and math performance but this upgraded one was now pulling a 3.8 and 11.39, respectively. Comparing that against a Mac 2 showed that the Prodigy actually scored better in, well, everything. The difference isn't just something you see in benchmarks. The whole machine feels far more responsive now, even down to navigating through folders and scrolling in text documents. Another neat feature that could speed things up further was the ability to add a RAM disk. The Prodigy card could let its contents persist across reboots, though not power cycles, and the utility to set it up even let you have certain files or folders automatically get copied to it when the machine was powered on. You could run the entire OS from the RAM disk if you wanted. 
overall, the Prodigy SE got favorable reviews despite its cost and the fact it wasn't the only upgrade of its kind on the market. It went head-to-head -head with the Hypercharger from GCC and the Peak Systems Orion, which offered similar speeds at around the same price. But the Prodigy SE wasn't Levco's first accelerator, having released ones for earlier Compact Max, so the SE model was generally pretty polished and well-designed. And this caught the attention of another Mac upgrade maker called SuperMac. It was perhaps best known for its video cards, including ones for the Mac SE, and wanted to broaden its product portfolio. In August 1987, just a few months after the Prodigy SE was released, it acquired Levco and rebranded the product line. Over the next few years, Apple would introduce more Mac models at different price points to try to fill the gaps that the upgrade makers targeted. This included a souped-up Mac SE that was basically a Mac 2 on the inside, and which had its own interesting story. But in 1987, if you had a compact Mac and found it to be too slow, upgrades like the Prodigy were a compelling choice. They certainly weren't a cheap option, but they were still cheaper than buying a whole new computer outright, and in this case, gave you even better performance. Technology was moving at breakneck pace during this era, and the engineering involved to pull it off is nothing short of impressive. And if you had the cash to spare, you too could get your run-of-the-mill Mac moving along in the fast lane.